Tiger Lumi has a really interesting story. It was brought back from the Dominican Republic in Lake Miragon in Haiti by uh, Dominic Isla in 1999. He had misidentified it as Lumia guarnii, um, or guarnii, and uh, sold them to the hobby uh, from his uh, little business called Coco Aquatics. And a member uh, got some and then really liked them and wrote a paper about them, put it in the American Live Bearers Journal at, at the time. And a, a couple of people uh, who were not uh, fans of uh, Dominic uh, got quite upset that he had named this that the, as the Gwonerai because it, uh, they didn't feel that that was what this was. And as it turned out, it is a new species. So they're still in the process of getting it identified. Um, and interestingly, some of those people who didn't like Dominic are kind of getting involved and have kind of slowed the process down, but we're hoping to get it together here pretty soon, and as soon as we have a formal scientific name up for these guys, um, I will post it at the website. They're uh, very peaceful, very non-aggressive, uh, they breed really well. Uh, when they first came in, uh, this is from the original batch I got from Dominic that he first brought back. And when they first uh, came into the hobby, they were somewhat nitrate intolerant. And they were also very sensitive to any, like chlorine or any kind of additions to the water. Um, after uh, now 16 years, 17 years of being kept in aquariums, and they're not quite as nitrate intolerant, they do really well, they even crowd fairly, uh, fairly well. Um, but they are the fish that if you've got a, uh, if you happen to run a little too much chlorine into a tank or, you have a solvent or something that manages to get its way into the water, um, these guys will show a response to it first. Um, but generally they're, they're, they're quite hardy and, and, and easy going, um, a really cool fish. Now if you notice on a tiger lemme, I'll go ahead and uh, bring up a, a male here. Here's a male so we can get him in focus. You can see the gonopodium. Um, they have a, a little bit stockier of a body shape than the females, but not by much. And they definitely don't have the high body of the Limia nigra fasciata, which is what this was thought to be a juvenile form of for many years. There's another male. And um, now that you've seen what these guys look like, we'll go over and look at the nigra fasciata. This is the fish that the Limia tiger is not. This is Limia nigra fasciata. And the tigers were thought for the longest time just to be adolescent or juvenile forms of this fish, but they were found to be separate species, although the tiger Limia is a subspecies of these guys. That's been shown genetically. And uh, they're about the same to keep. They're both from Lake uh, Miragon in Haiti. Uh, the, these guys I, I find to be a little more um, sensitive to the conditions and to the foods they get. Um, I, it's really important to give them uh, uh, brine shrimp every day. And they really don't do well when they're in a straight bare bottom tank. They need to have some, a little bit of substrate to, to uh, provide nitrifying bacteria. If the conditions are too totally clean, they don't do real well. But they're easy to keep, they're prolific. A very cool looking fish and there will be a video on these guys coming out down the road. But these were what the tiger limias were thought to be for the longest time and as you can see the males on the tiger limias uh, don't get to look like this at all. Here's a 20 tall of the tigers. You can see it's full of fry. Um, they do really well with, uh, with plants, live plants. Um, you want, as long as you feed them well and their water is good, uh, they, like I say, they don't bother their fry much, um, and the fry are easy to raise, um, and they will actually, I'll have to go in here and call this back a bit, because it's, or at least separate this into two tanks, so there's quite a few here. The, the tiger limias were kept in, in good number at the CU lab in Boulder um, until two years ago when the, when the lab closed down. So to my understanding, I have uh, four tanks of them here, and these are the last uh, that are being kept in any number anywhere. But um, I hope to keep them going, and if you'd like any of these guys, please email me at selectproducts at gmail.com, and uh, we'll work out getting either a fry group of six to them or a couple of pair to you.
Okay, Joshua writes, I'd like to get some tiger lumias, but at the website you say they are more sensitive to contaminants in the water. Do you mean chlorine? Aren't all fish sensitive to chlorine? Um, the tiger lumias, they were discovered in 1999 by Dominic Isla. And when he first brought them over, I was lucky enough to get a couple of pairs from him uh, from that first collection that he, that he did, and I've had them here ever since. And when they first came into the hobby, um, they were a little trickier to keep. They were by sensitive. Yeah, sure, certainly they were sensitive to chlorine. Um, whereas I would, I found generally I can do up to about a 35 to 40 percent water change on a tank with uh, chlorinated water and not have a problem. But with the tigers, they would start showing trouble if I put in more than about 20 percent of water into a tank uh, that hadn't been dechlorinated. So I knew they were sensitive to contaminants. But for instance, you know, in my fish room, it's all full of PVC with all that PVC glue and such. And um, I once had a, had a time, well, it's happened to me twice, where I had to fix a, uh, a, a joint uh, near, the, near the tiger lineas, uh, which required that I pulled out something and then glued the PVC together and put it together, which can release some fumes uh, possibly into the, into the water. When I first set up a PVC system like that, and I'll do a, a video on how to build that system. We'll do it step by step. So that's in the works and it's down the road. But anyway, when you're first doing that, I usually let the system sit for at least three or four days with everything open so that all of the glue dissipates. But in this, uh, these two instances, I went ahead and I had to fix a joint near the Tiger Limias, um, and it wiped out the Tiger Limia tank. So I knew they were, which, where it didn't bother anybody else. So I knew that uh, the tigers, um, I always keep an eye on them and make sure that, uh, um, that when I've got some kind of contaminant going on, whatever it is, that I keep it away from the tiger limias. Now the thing about these fish, as I mentioned in the last video, is when you get them, like you get two pair from me or you get six young, they're sexing out. The first thing you want to do is get young that you can then have been born in your water and then you're, you're well suited. So those first fish you get, you want to make sure that you do everything you can to get the fry um, uh, from them and raise them up so that they'll do well, well in your tanks. So contaminants and water quality are a big issue. And uh, with the tigers, they'll do okay in the smaller net breeders, but with a lot of fish, what you don't realize is when you uh, create, when you put the females into a breeder, many species don't do well in, in the net breeders. And uh, what's even worse is that you're creating this little, little tank within a tank when you're doing that. And when you're adding food to the breeder, you end up with creating uh, ammonia and nitrate and such in that little breeder, just like that goes on in the tank, but on a smaller scale. So you can have a situation where you've got young in that breeder um, the rest of the tank is doing fine, but then uh, because of fish that, the food that's accumulating on the bottom of the breeder um, that may be releasing ammonia or whatever, uh, you can actually manage to kill off uh, your fry. And so water quality with how a breeder is kept and, and getting those fry to do well for you when they're first born for you uh, is really important. So how I do that here and how I address that very issue, uh, we have to go down to the fish room. So. Uh, from here, we'll go ahead and we'll take a look. For those of you who don't have an option of building a, you know, setting up a separate tank, uh, you know, with plants or whatever, for a female to drop her fry, so that, uh, and then to pull her out after she has the fry, and you're looking for another method to uh, save your fry and do best. It's funny how when you're looking at net breeders and such, a variety of problems come up, some that you don't expect. Uh, particularly with water quality issues. For example, I used to, you know, I use the net breeders, and we'll talk about those here in a moment. But someone mentioned to me that you can just hang a net in the tank, which is a very cool thing. And uh, when you do that, you would then go ahead and put a net into the tank, put the female into the net, and then the young would be born into the net. The female would swim around in there. She'd be in the same tank with her with the rest of the fish that she came just came from. Uh, they don't pick on her. She's usually fine. Uh, it's really low stress for the female. It's a great thing. And then you take the female out, and then you raise the young up. The problem is, I found pretty quickly 
that food then settles to the very bottom, the very peak of the net, and then you start getting ammonia. And I've lost many netfuls of fry that way. Uh, it just it just kills the fry, particularly with things like the crackadons. So I don't use that any longer. So when you're using one of the inexpensive breeders that you can buy at most pet stores uh, to harvest your fry, there's uh, three basic types that I've seen uh, that I use here. Um, uh, but when the when you buy the breeder and you set it up, this is one of the most common. Um, I wouldn't put uh, females with smaller fry in here, uh, like the Alpharocultratus, because they uh, they are able to get out through some of these holes and some of that sort of sort of business. Um, they're not the best for for being great about no fry getting out, but they work. But the issue is that when you're using one of these these breeders, and it's it's more than just a container for the female to have her fry, so you can net her and pull her out. It's actually an environment. It's a, a little tank within a tank kind of thing, because the flow through on the on these breeders is pretty good. But if you've got a lot of food building up, and you have you certainly want to put some plants in there so that the uh, female has some has some places to hide, the young have some places to hide. Not a lot, but enough so she can swim around. But you end up creating a little mini environment inside the tank. And so you have to be careful that your nitrate and ammonia levels don't get too high, which is very common. Um, it doesn't take much uh, to, uh, to get yourself into a, to a bloom. And because of the varying conditions in, in a breeder, some females, and also because some females don't like being confined, some females do one of two things. They either uh, drop their fry as soon as you put them in the breeder within a day or so, whether they were ready or not, and oftentimes the young are all born dead, which is uh, what uh, the Mika Splendens is that way, um, uh, or uh, the, the female you put them in there and they end up dying uh, and don't have the young at all because the conditions deteriorate past their liking. Um, the crocodiles can sometimes be that way. So you can have other choices. now. The second type of breeder that's very similar is one of these guys here. Bigger holes, uh, do not put fry and females in there. End of story, great if you've got a fish that uh, needs to be isolated or you, you have some older fish that need to be uh, kept separate, but uh, I would never hatch fry in that. And then the most common kind of breeder the one that I use most often here are this type, but they're made pretty crappily, and you can see that the hooks have already broken off of this, but they do float, which is great. Um, and they also have that really fine uh, nylon mesh around the outside, so this, these are the types of breeders I use, say, for the Odessa barbs, when I want to siphon water out of a tank and not suck in anything from the surrounding tank, like young fry and such. Um, but as a rule, all three of these breeders are essentially too small for most of the fish that you have here. So what I did was I went out and I bought a, a standard uh, plastic shoebox container and I cut the bottom out of it and um, I took a second container and I cut it up into strips and then uh, I have a, a mesh uh, nylon mesh that I bought at Walmart uh, that, I, that I put across the bottom and then I put these strips over the mesh to glue and with a marine glue glued the strips on the bottom to glue the mesh into place so that now I have a, 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 a container uh, where the water can uh, can go in and out of the of the of the box really easily then I went over to Home Depot and picked up uh, just a couple of these little metal dealies. Well, they're like, you know, 50 cents a piece of that. And a couple of screws to hold it on. Attached it with electrical ties with holes that I had drilled into the, into the plastic container. And that works as a handle to hold it on in like that. And then when you put it on the side, it's gonna droop down a little bit like that. And then with a simple piece of duct tape, just go ahead and tape it on around and it holds it in place. However tight you have this depends on how deep the breeder is going to be. And now you've got a, a fairly uh, clean environment 
that is more easy, the water, it's a larger body of water, so it's going to deteriorate less quickly. Um, and you have a, a great access to the bottom to, uh, to keep it clean. And the fish have a lot of room to swim around so that when a female has her young, they can disappear and uh, she doesn't bother to go chase them. Uh, these are great for the alfalfa coltratus, uh, the crocodons, and, um, and most, well, actually, most of the gudeas. Uh, uh, at first, when my numbers are low, or with anything where the numbers are not real great and I don't want to put them into just a tank and let them uh, community breed, I'll use these types of containers. I've got about 10 of these built here at the room and, and uh, uh, they go through the room and, are, and uh, they've worked excellently. But, uh, so this is kind of the way you want to go when, you're, when you really want to save all your fry and, and produce healthy fry and then have the female come out of it having it been a good experience as opposed to something that may tend to shorten her lifespan. As well, you'll find out the hard way that there are some species that really should not be uh, uh, born in a breeder and the young uh, attempted to be raised up in the breeder. Uh, the Zephyrus Montezuma, for example, if you have a female, however large, you know, if she can be a smaller female and it might seem just, just great for a breeder, uh, she has her fry, say you've got 10 to 20 fry, the young, when they're in a confined container of the breeder, for some reason here, I found that they developed a number of bacterial problems, uh, buoyancy issues, various things that other swordtails didn't exhibit. So the Montes are put into, uh, are, are allowed to drop their fry in the community tanks that they're in, or not the community, but the colony tanks they're in. Uh, the young are then scooped out and then put into 10 gallon uh, tanks like this where they're grown out, but they're never kept in confined conditions. However, the bigger breeder that I mentioned is perfect for a lot of the swordtails. The Alvarezi do really well in, in those breeders as well as the Maiai and most of the others. Jake writes, now Jake is a friend who I've been writing back and forth with for quite a while, a um, couple of years, and uh, he was writing me about uh, uh, the ALA and different the history of the ALA and he asked me uh, did you know Dominic Isla? Um, yes I knew Dominic Isla. For those of you who don't know that name uh, he is probably uh, one of the most colorful and difficult characters ever to be in the live bearer hobby. Um, I got to know him very well. Uh, he's no longer with us. He uh, uh, passed away uh, in 2009 um, and uh, if there was, a, a, well, I'll tell you what, kind of how I came about finding out this guy. Now, the reason why we're mentioning him is because he's the guy that discovered and brought back the Tiger Limia. Um, he used to make trips to the Dominican Republic and uh, to uh, Haiti and to Mexico. Um, usually every year he'd be going down, sometimes, every, uh, sometimes he would skip a year, but he would bring back duffel bags full of fish um, and then uh, sell them uh, out to the hobby. This is pre-internet. Uh, people would write them and uh, he would send pairs of fish out. And he advertised in the uh, Live Bear Journal and in the, uh, or the Live Bear Trader of the ALA and that's how people knew about him and I had ordered a, a pair of fish from him. But many of the fish in the hobby um, back then and certainly today possibly originally came from fish that Dominic Isla had brought back. So that's one of the reasons why he's a really important character. But a uh, character he was. I got elected to the a uh, ALA and onto the board and I became chairman and uh, went to my first convention in 2000. Um, and at that time I was new to the ALA. No one knew who I was. Um, I uh, uh, was, it was an unknown entity. And so here I am at the convention and people are all trying to be nice to me and such throughout the course of the day. Um, and then that evening about five people came over at about uh, uh, seven o'clock at night and brought a bunch of beer with him and such and decided to kind of just sit down and, and feel out this new guy from the uh, as to what he was about and what you know how he thought and all that sort of business and so they started telling me all their usual stuff and you know who the who the interesting people are in the ALA who to get to know who to avoid all that sort of thing and at about 10 o'clock that night the name Dominic Isla came up as people were getting a little bit tipsy people started laughing and uh, um, and uh, I had no idea uh, about this guy. Well, at around quarter to two in the morning, um, I finally said, hey, look, you know, I got to go to bed because I've got to get up early because we've got all kinds of chairman stuff I got to do in the morning. I got to take off. 
they hadn't stopped talking about Dominic Isla. So I knew at that time that I needed to find out who this guy was and kind of figure out, for better or worse, what he was about. So anyway, I was in Southern California at that time. That's where I lived. Um, many years later, I ended up having to move out to Denver. Well, it turns out that's where Dominic is from. So I now live in Denver. And when I first came here, uh, because I had ordered a pair of fish from him long before, I wrote him a, a, a quick letter and I just said, hey, you know, I've just moved to town and, and um, I don't know who the fish group people are, wh where the fish clubs are. Um, you know, if you have a moment, you know, could you possibly let me know, guide me in the right direction as to who I might need to get to know and get to talk to. So he contacted me back and we talked on the phone. And he said, I'll take you to the first meeting. Um, okay, great. So time for the first meeting comes up. He calls me. He lives down in Denver. I was about, well, I'm still about 40 minutes north of Denver. And he says, well, can you come get me? I don't have a car. Oh, okay. So I go down, I get him, and I take him to the killifish meeting. So he introduces me to the people in the killifish club. And a lot of my connections here in Denver came from the introductions that were first made to me by Dominic. Um, but I came to find out that uh, when you, as you meet people that know Dominic well, everybody has Dominic stories. And everybody tries to compare to see if their stories are crazier than the previous person's stories. Now to give you an idea of what he looked like, here's a picture of Dominic. He's standing out in front of Coco Aquatics, which was his little business in a warehouse uh, strip mall kind of thing uh, here in Denver. Uh, that thing he's leaning against is a big old hot tub that was full of fish. And it was usually his uh, things that uh, were sick or things that were mis malformed or things he didn't want or extras or whatever. So you would go there and look in that, in that hot tub and see fish in there that today you never see in the hobby. Things like Limia sulfurophylla, um, Limia dominicensis, uh, Limia tridens. You know, we would be swimming around nobody's business in this, in this hot tub. Um, he, uh, he eventually, um, uh, he decided at one point he was going to, to leave Denver he, and get out of the fish trade, which he did. He went to New Orleans, got a cart, sold buttons, uh, rock uh, concert buttons on street corners for a while, then came back to Denver, uh, realizing that wasn't the future he hoped it would be. And uh, um, lots of stories about getting him set back up again, getting him in here. Um, and then he ran into a, a, a number of issues um, and anyway passed away of a drug overdose in, in 2009. Um, this is a picture of his fish room. Now this kind of gives you an idea of how he thought there were fish people who wouldn't walk into his room uh, because uh, there, it, everything appeared as if it was about to collapse at any moment. Um, I remember I once got accused by Dominic of having cracked one of his 55 gallon tanks simply by walking past it, which I thought was interesting. But um, that was just Dominic. You know, he would get upset at you for any number of things, and as long as you blew him off, and he realized that uh, that you weren't going to, you know, weren't going to get upset at him, then everything was fine and dandy. But uh, he was a, a a real piece of work. So, anyway, that's Dominic Isla. Thank you for watching this video on the Tiger Limias. And in two weeks, the next video will be on keeping plants on the Rapid Grow Aquarium Plant Fertilizer and on keeping plants inexpensively and effectively. So. Uh, stay tuned. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you soon. If you have a question you'd like to see answered here on live bears or breeding Odessa barbs or any of the fish that I have here at Select Aquatics, um, please email, email it to me at selectaquatics at gmail.com, and, uh, and I'll use it here if I can. Um, the stranger, the better. So uh, I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much.